Um, I'd like to thank the Nonprofit and Public Management Center and their directors, Marina Whitman and Megan Tompkins Stang, for co sponsoring our event today. And I'd also like to thank St. Mary's Parish for helping us to host today's very special guest. Well, Policy Talks at the Ford School am aims to create a very full picture of the policy making process. Throughout the year, we have heard from presidential cabinet members from state and local politicians and activists, from ambassadors, political scientists, and more. Today, I'm really delighted to include a highly respected voice from the heart of nonprofit religious and social justice persuasion on the US legislative process, Sister Simone Campbell. Sister Simone belongs to the Catholic Sisters of Social Service. She is also a lawyer, lobbyist, and activist. And since 2000, she has led Network, a national Catholic social justice lobby focused on economic justice, immigration reform, health care, peacemaking, and ecology. Network's nun's letter to Congress was instrumental in the reform of national health care in 2010. And despite provoking a very harsh critique from the Vatican, the nun's efforts prevailed. The Affordable Care Act, as we well know, was signed into law. <laughs> And Sister Simone stood right next to President Obama at the signing ceremony. This experience inspired Sister Simone to create Nuns on the Bus, which on the one hand is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> nuns tour the country on a bus in service of the Catholic Church's commitment to social justice. Beyond that, though, it's really a brilliant strategy for connecting with thousands of Americans around the country and pressuring politicians for change in social policy. Since 2013, they've tackled a number of critical policy issues, including immigration reform, voter turnout, and wealth inequality. And many of these are issues on which Sister Simone will elaborate in her lecture today. Well, following Sister Simone's remarks, we will take questions from the audience. So at around 4.30 or so, we will have staff members in the aisles to collect questions. Please write them on cards that you should have received as you came in. They'll also have other cards to distribute if anyone needs one. Um, and we will also welcome questions for those of us watching online via Twitter. Please use the hashtag policy talks. Professor Ann Lynn, together with four, two Ford School students, Carson Smith and Brenda Diverse, will facilitate the question and answer period when we get there. So now, please join me in a very warm Ford School welcome to Sister Simone Campbell. Thank you. What a treat to be here. Um, I was uh, thinking as I was coming that the utter richness of being able to spend some time reflecting on policy in a time where the practice of public policy is so challenging. And I know you all survived your primary yesterday, so I just want to acknowledge that the up-close reality of politics is quite near and dear to my heart and to all of us at this point as we're struggling through the presidential cycle. But I want to talk more about the policies that are what we say in DC are more about how our people live and the flourishing of our nation than I want to talk about the partisan divides that are going on. Uh, part of me feels like I just want to put my head under the covers some days. I don't know if any of you share that pain, but uh, there's got to be a better way than this. But let's focus on the needs of our people, and I think that can make the difference. So. Um, the, the theme is uh, Pope Francis' challenge to policymakers, mend the gap. Um, I had the opportunity to be in the congressional chambers when Pope Francis addressed uh, Congress. I was in the front row. It was really cool of uh, the gallery. Um, it was this amazing thing of somewhat of a harmonious Congress, and the parties had agreed that no one party would, that they would all applaud. They didn't want to make partisan 
uh, campaigning around Pope Francis's talk. And so the first few things that Pope Francis said was about the economy, a critique of the economy. And the Democrats jumped up and applauded. <laughs> and you could see the Republicans get up slowly and applauded. <laughs> and then the, you know, that happened a couple of times. And then Pope Francis said the code words. That's why we're for the dignity of all life. And the Republicans jumped up and applauded. And the Democrats got up slowly. But then Pope Francis said, and that's why I've made my papacy about the global abolition of the death penalty. And it was like a wind in the room because everybody went, <gasps> and that collective reality created this vacuum. I mean, it was amazing. But what I realized was that Pope Francis's focus on the needs of real people and the needs of the common good create a politics that is not divisive and is not partisan. He creates a space where his focus is on the needs of those who are left out. And so in the recent, well, I guess it's about almost a year now, the encyclical Laudato Si, there's a lot of conversation about how it's about the environment, it's about uh, economics, but the amazing thing is it's also about politics because there are 32 paragraphs out of 200 and some where he discusses the political responsibility. And at paragraph 57, he says that politics must pay greater attention to foreseeing new conflicts and addressing the causes which can lead to them. But powerful financial interests prove most resistant to this effort. And political planning tends to lack breadth of vision. And then he goes on to say, what would induce anyone at this stage to hold on to power only to be remembered for their inability to take action when it was urgent and necessary to do so? I believe that's the Speaker Boehner clause. <laughs> That explains a fair amount of what happened when Speaker Boehner resigned the next day after, or said he was resigning, the next day after Pope Francis was in, the, in uh, addressing Congress. So for me, what that challenges us to be is to be a nation where politics has a broader view, where we see the consequences of policy, not just in terms of me and mine, but in terms of we and the common good, where we reclaim our constitution to be we the people. Now, in the Great Depression, there appears to have been a commonality, a sense of coming together, where the extreme wealth of the 20s, the roaring 20s, got balanced out and people came together. And my mother used to tell this story about her dad, who ran a newspaper, a weekly newspaper in Colorado, and um, the Aurora Democrat, and he received in barter payment for ads. Now, my mother, to her dying day, detested movies because my grandfather was paid by it for the ads for the movies by tickets to go see the movie. And my grandmother said, of course we have to go be an audience for the person who ran the, the theater. We're going to the movies. So they used every single theater or uh, to the movies ticket that they got. And my mother detested it. Because every day, according to her memory of her youth, they went to the movies. <laughs> she hated it. But what it taught me was that my grandmother wasn't so much concerned about the quality of payment and what that was good. She knew that by being paid with tickets that the owner of the theater needed an audience. And she knew her responsibility was to help make an audience. So he, the owner felt like he was doing something for the community. It's a level of the common good which is not usually thought of these days. And the challenge, I believe, is to reframe who we are as a nation. And I'm a Californian, many of you know that, and 
we exported, I'm sorry to say, one of our governors to be president in uh, the great uh, conf or, uh, campaign of 1980, we exported Ronald Reagan who had this idea of, uh, who actually successfully rewrote the founding story of the US by, in my view, by coming to this idea that one lone horseman, a man, <laughs> rode off into the West and settled the West all by himself. Now, I watch television and I know there were wagon trains West. <laughs> It was more than one person, because if you only had one wagon even, and somebody hollered, circle the wagons, you had trouble. <laughs> and I also know that for barn raisings, that we had uh, more than one person, if only one person showed up, well, you weren't gonna raise much of a barn. And I know from personal experience that when it came to quilting, I had a quilt I worked on for over five years and I finally decided, oh my glory, let's finish the damn thing. I got my friends together to, to do it. You couldn't quilt alone. It required community. And the challenge that we're facing in our nation right now is that we've changed the story of our nation from community to an individual, to each one of us alone. And only in the richest nation on earth could we get away with this arrogance. And what we're trying to do is to, what I believe Pope Francis is challenging us to do, is to mend the gaps, to bridge the divides, to bring us back together to the truth that we're based in community. Now, what I've discovered in community is that we don't all agree. Have you noticed that? <laughs> that we have some very different perspectives. And the challenge that we face is how do we bring these different perspectives to the table? So in this effort, Pope Francis, in uh, Joy of the Gospel, which was a, a document, he is, document he issued in November of 13, I believe, in paragraph 54, he does his, his economic analysis. And since the Ford School is so engaged in the economics of all of this, I thought I should include it. He said that, uh, Pope Francis says, some people continue to defend trickle-down theories which assume that economic growth encouraged by a free market will inevitably succeed in bringing about greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, expresses a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power and in the sacralized workings of the prevailing economic system. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the excluded are still waiting. This is the problem that we're facing in our society, is that trickle down, 30 years of trickle down, 40 years of trickle down, has failed to lift all boats. It's lifted the boats of the few. And the boats of the few continue to amass more and more money. And then we have translated money into speech. And so money into speech now controls our, our political reality to bridge to mend the gaps, we have got to bridge the divides that have been created by a failed effort at trickle-down economics. What's the alternative? Hmm. <laughs> Some people like to tell me, oh, it's socialism, that's the only thing. No, there's a long way between trickle-down and socialism. And I think that's some of the challenge of academic institutions is to figure out ways forward. So I'd like to raise up a few of the stories that I've heard as we've done these business roundtables around the country. Um, I, I talk about the 100%. I'm, we're trying to be for the 100%. I have a favorite part of the 100%, but I want to be for the 100%. So I realized in um, 2014 that we didn't know much about business. I'm a lawyer. I practice law. I ran a law office. But that's not exactly the you know, sort of entrepreneurial, but I wanted to understand the entrepreneurial reality more. And so we did these 13 business roundtables around the country and um, learned some very interesting things. The one in Chicago, which was early on in the process, it had just come out before that roundtable that the average salary for a CEO of a publicly traded company was $10 million a year and that they were going for 11 million. So I had this gaggle of uh, 
you know, entrepreneurs and hedge fund guys and heads of corporations. And so I said to them, they were all men, and I said to them, well, you know, I heard this about the CEO, average CEO salary of 10 million and that they're going for 11 million. I, I, I don't quite understand. Is it that you're not getting by on 10 million? Is that the problem? <laughs> you just need a little extra? Is that the deal? And this guy said really quickly, Rich said to me, oh no, Sister Simone, it's not about the money. I go, what? <laughs> you could have fooled me. And he said, no, we're very competitive. We want to win. It just happens that the current measure of winning is money. Now I tested it out at other roundtables after that and it got affirmed. One guy in Northern Virginia, I'll never forget, he heads up a, um, a uh, uh, what do you call it, a hospitality industry uh, corporation, and they have over 400 hotels around the world, and he's the CEO, and he said, oh, that's absolutely true. I'll be damned if I'm paid less than my competitor when I'm doing a better job for my company. Why would I do that? That's wrong. Who? Okay, I can see it's wrong, but the competitive salaries, this measure of winning, couldn't we find some other measure that's a little less toxic for the people who are doing the cleaning or the janitorial work? How do we bridge, how do we yet win? And here's, I am a, a lawyer, so I'm extremely competitive. I don't play board games because I'm a sore loser. So <laughs> yeah, I get competition. <laughs> But what I don't get is competition with a measure that can be so toxic in our society. At another, um, at another round table, we were talking, and uh, this one guy volunteered. I, we did that riff, and he volunteered that he was getting upset. He's a 35-year-old. He built his third corporation. He was about ready to sell it off because he was going to be a new dad, and he wanted to have time with his new baby. But um, he said he was getting upset because he realized that he paid all of his workers a living wage. And in paying a living wage, he realized his tax dollars were going to fund his competitors. It's like a what? His competitors don't pay a living wage to everybody. They pay low wages. And so his competitors have lower personnel costs. Lower personnel costs then causes those low paid workers to go use the social safety net, which used to be just for folks who fell on hard times. And so the low wage workers were going to use things like food stamps, Medicaid, and uh, housing vouchers if they could get them. And what they, what Jason, this entrepreneur said, he realized his tax dollars were paying for the social safety net. So his tax dollars were funding his competitors who could underbid him. But he, in principle, believed he should pay a living wage. Well, I never thought of it that way. I came to realize that our current social safety net has become a business subsidy as much as it is for people who have fallen on hard times. In 2014, 67% of the people who used any of the social safety net programs 67% had at least, those households, had at least one adult work, working full time. We've got trouble. So I raised that at other business roundtables, and this one guy said to me, in Denver, this guy says, well, yeah, if you take an edge, why wouldn't you get it? Why wouldn't you take it? In, uh, where were we? Uh, in, uh, Shoot, where were we? I can see the room, but I don't remember where we were. <laughs> oh, in Richmond, Virginia. We're there, and, the, and uh, this guy said, well, you know, if you don't make us internalize costs, we won't. Internalize cost becomes code words for paying a living wage. I always thought the idea of the market was that the market charged a rate that covered it, the fees, the costs, covered actual costs. 
But we've changed that to the market being about profit. And anything you do to create profit is what matters. That is eating the heart out of our democracy. Because it's not like we're in this together. OK, so what do we do? Network has this uh, new effort. We are trying to mend the gaps. And uh, it's kind of fun in a, a time of paralyzed politics that we create a chance to uh, do something positive. So we've got seven policies that we're working on to mend the gaps. Um, and I'll just treat them um, briefly, and then you can ask me questions about it. But we've realized that we have got to find a way to come together as people, as business workers, <laughs> families, uh, as nonprofits, as advocates, everybody. We've got to find a way to have conversation about the commons, about the contribution to the commons. And we're now setting up for a, or Speaker Ryan is setting up for a big effort at tax reform in 2017. And in that conversation, we have got to be clear about tax policy for the common good. And the common good means that it's good for Jason and Rich, the entrepreneur, but also good for Robin, who works full time at a profitable clothing store chain, but still tells me that by looking at her, I would never know that she still has to live in a homeless shelter because she doesn't make enough at minimum wage. To, to pay rent in the DC area. We have got to make sure that everyone's voice is at the table. Part of the challenge of that is that private industry hires pesky lobbyists. Since I'm a lobbyist, I, I'm a lobbyist and a lawyer, so I can make noise about pesky lobbyists. But what we discovered was is that most regulations, most proposed laws start off very simple. And what happens is, is uh, business hires lobbyists. And lobbyists are very effective to carve out a little space, a little special gift, uh, making sure that my industry is considered specially. Then in that carve out, it creates five, 10 more pages of regulation to create the carve out. And if everybody's getting their little carve out, by the time you get through with permanent regulations, You've had very successful lawyering has created this small little regulation into a massive regulation. And then you know what business has the nerve to do? Rail against the regulation. Well, at the business roundtable, we discovered that the complexity of regulation is created by effective lobbying, which business hired to create their little separate entity. And then they rail against their result. In the tax process, we have got to find a way for everyone to be at the table. We've got to find a way where we see our tax dollars as investment in our future. And we have got to see our way that part of our responsibility to the future is that we invest not just for ourselves, but for our posterity, as it says in the Constitution. Tax policy is going to be the center the ground zero in a military metaphor of trying to create the common good. Let's have more conversation about that. The second piece that we've got to work on is wages and organizing. Uh, Michigan's a great, a great state for this. You all led the way with good wages, good jobs, labor organizing that got undermined. Uh, again, by beloved President Reagan, who very effectively put a wedge between the worker and the unions. Some of what he said was true, but the problem was that it wasn't because they were unions that they were bad, it was because they were humans they were bad. And so, uh, as a person of faith, I, I talk about original sin, and that seems to be the stumbling block. So, what we, and nobody talks about the well, some people do, but not terribly effectively, the flaws of corporations. At that very same time, Reagan was lifting up corporations as being a 
great model, you know, leaders of corporation, leaders of industry, captains of industry, and putting a wedge between the worker and the union, that effectively kept wages flat for the last 40 years. We've got to change that reality, either through unions, through organizing, through something that raises wages. Because for me, it's wrong that you work in the richest nation on earth full time and you still live in poverty. That's wrong. While the leader of your corporation that you're contributing to collects $10 million and is going for 11. The $10 million a year number works out at 40 hours a week, works out to be $5,000 an hour. So the CEO makes in three hours what the minimum wage worker makes in a year. Doesn't seem right to me. It's not good for our society, and it's creating the huge gaps and the huge anger that's currently being seen in the electorate, I believe. So we've got to deal with wages. And finally, we've got to create, well, on the economic side, we've got to create family-friendly workplaces. The fact is, if we're going to value our families, we cannot just be seen as cogs in the wheels of production. Work in Catholic social teaching, which is what we're rooted in, work is supposed to be at the service of humans, not humans at the service of work. So that means pesky details like, hmm, perhaps fast food workers ought to have some paid time off for sick days. Do you know without paid time off, desperate low wage workers in fast food industry have a tendency to come to work so they can have their hours and support their families, even if they're sick? I don't know about you, but I, I don't think that's a great public health uh, model. <laughs> Please keep your germs at home. But desperate people will do what they need. This is wrong. Simple, wrong. So at least paid sick time makes the most sense. So those are our economic ones. Then we've also got access gaps. Access gaps that are sucking the life out of our democracy. The first one is access to voting. All of the work that's being done to drive people away from the polls. I mean, some of us were wonks. I mean, we're, we're at the Ford School, so of course we care about this stuff. But the fact is, not everybody shares our passion. <clears throat> and we were door knocking in the 2014 election when we were on the bus. Knocked on a lot of doors in a lot of places. But I'll never forget knocking on this one door in Colorado Springs, a conservative area. A tall African-American young man comes to the door, opens the door, and we get talking. And it uh, turns out he's a disabled vet. So it was either Iraq or Afghanistan, I don't know. And he was getting good support from the VA. And then I said to him, well, I'm out door knocking to see if people are going to vote. And so are you going to vote? It blew my mind. He said no. He was not going to vote. You put your life on the line for our nation and you're not going to vote? And what he said chilled my heart. My opinion is not wanted in this neighborhood. Colorado Springs a white community <clears throat> didn't want this African-American to vote, even though he had put his life on the line for the nation. We have got to stand up for real democracy, which means even the people I disagree with have a chance to vote. The other thing that we found in the 2014 um, bus trip was how negative advertising drives away the muddled middle the folks who are not the base. Negative advertising causes people to end up saying a pox on both their houses. I don't know, too complicated, way beyond me, I'm not voting. Do you know our bus driver, 74-year-old Bill Kahn, <clears throat> told me on the last bus trip in, in the fall, in September, well, Sister Simone, I'm going to vote for the first time this year. Bill, you've been driving our bus and you haven't voted? <laughs> nope, haven't voted. It's kind of complicated. And then he said to me, want to know who I'm going to vote for? And said, oh, Bill, well, he's kind of conservative. So I was like, oh, Bill, I'm not sure I want to know. Do you want to tell me? Oh, yeah, want to. want to tell you. Well, I'm going to vote for Donald Trump. Oh, Bill. 
<laughs> Please. Well, and so, holy curiosity, I tried to be uh, concerned, uh, not judgmental, always inviting everybody to the table. So I said, well, Bill, why are you going to do that? Well, I want somebody who can't be bought. The man is richer in God and can't be bought. And I thought, well, that's, that's a, good, a good reason. I wouldn't have learned the reason if I had done what my insides wanted to do, which was say, God, no. <laughs> but what I learned was, in complex times, simple emotion gra grabs people. And what we have to do, those of us that care wonkishly about all this stuff, we have to find another way to translate and connect. Because that emotion doesn't translate well into policy. And so how do we make a difference? So we need to access to democracy. We need access to health care. Health care is a mess. Uh, the Affordable Care Act is a significant step forward. But states that have not expanded Medicaid, uh, their health care systems are in crisis. And one of the things that I began to, that I heard from half of the business roundtables, volunteered, I didn't ask this question, but uh, lead, business leaders said that we've really got to move away from employer provided health care. We need to move towards a Medicare for all model, which was surprising to me, shocking to me, because in the 09 2010 fight, business was totally opposed to a Medicare for all model. But what they're finding is the administration and the cost is still crippling and problematic. But I think that evidence is that if we listen to each other, we can find places of convergence and improvement. The third area is on immigration reform. We've got to solve the immigration issues of our time. The fact is the exploitation of the uh, immigrant worker is uh, undermining wages, undermining our society, and creating fear in our communities. Uh, we have a, a young woman who's a dreamer, you know, the, who was brought here as a young child and is now has uh, DACA, the deferral of, of uh, deportation. And so she works at, at Network. And to hear her passion for fixing immigration reform so that her parents can have the same security that she has. And then talking with her, they've been here 18 years without going back to Mexico. She doesn't know Mexico at all. She came when she was three years old. And her parents have worked this entire time. And then her parents have also experienced wage theft, exploitation. But because they're undocumented, they won't complain. That's wrong in the richest nation on earth. It's wrong in any nation, but especially the richest nation. And finally, our policies, our proactive policy is housing. We've got to fix our housing policy. Housing is at the heart of a bunch of other policies. Housing is at the heart of our education system because that's how we fund our education, is through property tax. A nutty system, but it's the one we've got. Housing is at the heart of the fact that we're segregated, we're resegregated. Housing is at the heart of the fact that our economic segregation is even, almost even worse than our racial segregation. We're better than this. We can make a change. And housing is at the heart of some of our biggest problems around transportation. Um, in uh, San Antonio, uh, at the Business Roundtable, that I was told San Antonio did a study. They need 300,000 units of low and moderate income housing in the next 10 years. And they have no plan on how to get there. Because their state government is fighting so much with the feds, they won't ask for any help from housing and urban development. So our city, that they, San Antonio was saying, could you get us a little uh, provision in the law so we could negotiate directly with the feds? Because our people are suffering. But this is where the polarization is hurting everyone. We have got to find ways to build bridges. 
to bridge the divide, to transform the reality that's keeping us separate. Because it is that division that is sucking the life out of our, um, our economy. It's sucking the life out of our democracy. It's sucking the life out of our nation. So what I believe we see with Donald Trump, and to some extent uh, Cruz, is the anger at being left behind. And what I've realized is, is often that the source of that anger are middle class white men or lower middle class white men who've never had a movement. And a bunch of you guys here, so you could speak up during the comment part, but, but folk, folks who feel they've never been part of a movement. We've got the women's movement. We have the LGBTQ movement. We've got the Black Lives Matter. We've got the Hispanic movement. We've got dreamers. We've got a bunch of movements. And quite frankly, I've always thought, as a woman, I've always thought the, guys were, the white guys were in charge. But what I've come to realize is the loneliness of that position, is they never known that we're in it together. And so what Donald Trump, in his crass way, is doing is touching that hurt and anger, and now many feel like they've got someone who's championing them. But it's not a long-term solution, because it's dividing us. It's not bringing us together. And democracy cannot survive divided. So here's my policy idea that I'm planting here at the Ford School to see how, how you all might be able to pick it up and make it happen. And that is, rather than focusing on rights, which has, has a tendency to divide us, maybe we should focus on civil obligations. That everyone in a democracy has an obligation to participate. Everyone has an obligation to step into the conversation. Everyone has an obligation to bring their part and to stay open to the parts of others. Perhaps this is called heaven, but I do believe <laughs> I do believe we need to get closer to it if we're going to save our democracy. Because right now, the jury is still out on whether or not this democracy can be saved, in my view. The Greeks apparently had a vibrant democracy for about 200 years. And then, as I understand it, mostly through Wikipedia, so I probably shouldn't admit that, but <laughs> is that after about 200 years, the rich families of Athens started fighting. And then it, after about another 30, 40 years, a rich family sold Athens out to the Macedonians. Now, I'm not sure who the Macedonians are in our system, but I certainly see wealth fighting against each other. I see a division where we don't see the fact that we're in it together, a commonality. And I worry greatly, can we step back into the center? Can we step into our obligation for each other? Because that is what's going to mend the gaps, is if I hold your concern dearly as I hold my own, if I know you have my back and you know I'll have yours, but we've got to find a way to agree. So my basic urging is that we create a culture of civic obligations where in our obligations we come together and there's room for everyone in that. Because in a democracy, no one can be left out. So planting seeds, hoping they take root, so that again, once again, here at the Ford School, we could have something flourish, a new time. Thank you very much. Now for my favorite part. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for speaking um, to us today. My name is Brenda Duverse, and I am a second year graduate student here at the Ford School, a Master of Public Policy program. Um, my interest lies in uh, social policies and poverty alleviation strategies. Uh, you spoke a bit about civil, well, a lot about civic obligation, domestically um, speaking on the Black Lives Matter movement, LGBT movement. Um, but I was wondering, and I guess the audience was also wondering, um, can you comment a little about our international responsibility for the refugee crisis happening in Europe, um, both in refugees coming to Europe to stay and refugees fleeing um, Syria? 
Thank you for that. That's an issue really close to my heart. I stayed mostly domestic because that's mostly what we advocate on. But um, in uh, 2008, I got to go to uh, Beirut, at Lebanon, and Damascus to see the Iraqi refugee situation and learned a lot in that setting about the fluidity of borders and the fact that in the face of violence and crisis, people move. That is true. The part that is driving me nuts is that the US, in our specialness, fails to see and accept our role in creating the refugee crisis. And that we fail to see that it's been our analysis, of, our failed analysis of Middle East politics that has generated this reality. And so from my perspective, we have a responsibility to stand up and welcome the various refugees into our culture, into our society, into our nation. Now the challenge is because we feel so special, we don't have a very deep analysis of what's going on. And the reason I think we are in large measure responsible for the current Middle East crisis is because of, it started with the Iraq war, the invasion, under the misguided idea that we were going to go rescue the Iraqis and just happen to save their oil for us. Um, that then it created a huge disequilibrium because whatever you said about Hussein is that he had protected religious minorities. And he was not, they were not organized around religion, they were organized around politics, Bathus. And then our analysis, Brenner's analysis, was that it was around religion. So we imposed in an already complex world our analysis, which created a new balance of power. That balance of power has never found equilibrium because it was imposed from the outside. And so the same thing is happening in Syria. And when we were in Syria in 2008, I met the uh, Good Shepherd Sisters, who are Syrian. And they have the, had the first um, shelter for abused women in the Middle East, had the first outline for abused women, that Assad had held them up as an example in the Middle East, encouraged other Middle, Middle Eastern countries to respond to the needs of battered women in their society. Who knows that? We don't know that. And so when uh, we were thinking about bombing Syria, since we're so effective at the military option, that um, we reached out to the Good Shepherd Sisters and said, what do you think? What do you want? Because we try to base our, our policies on, from people on the ground. And Sister Marie Claude wrote back and said, Assad can be trouble. The insurgents are a problem and they make us nervous. But the US terrifies us because you have no idea who we are. Please, don't bomb us. So I say, let's deal with the humanitarian crisis. Let's get people food. Let's bring people in. Let's get over our specialness. But let's get some sanity about our international analysis of what's going on so we stop stomping around the world to get what we want. In 25 words or less, that's what I think. <laughs> Not that I have any feelings on the subject. Good question. Thanks. Go for Thank it. You. Hi, sister. Uh, Hi. My name is Carson. I'm an undergrad here at the Ford School, junior year, and uh, for the focus on public ethics, but also a minor in religion. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to hear it. I, mean, I also have a question. It's a question from the audience. But um, how does your Zen or contemplative practice inform the policy work you do? And I'll add something else on there, which is, if there were a spiritual tool or practice you could recommend to policymakers, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, actually, um, meditation's at the heart of what I do. Uh, because all of this stuff, I say, is like a snow globe. You know, I'm a Californian, so I didn't know snow. I'm not a Michigander. So uh, the only thing I knew about snow as a kid was that in the snow globe is that you shake it up, and then all this stuff goes along. Well, meditation is like when you put it down, and you let it all sink down. And for one brief shining moment, there's clarity. Occasionally, doing Zen practice, there's clarity. Now, um, and... The clarity is often about the pieces left out, about the, the 
H-O-L-E, not the W-H-O-L-E. <coughs> the, the piece is missing. And that, for me, has been the uh, really important for trying to move policy in a way so we don't get caught in our certitude where we can see what's missing. Um, also, I could say uh, you introduced the bus, and the bus was a direct response to the Vatican censure that named us as a bad influence on Catholic sisters. And, but meditation led me to, to ask the question, how do we use this moment for mission? Because four days before the Vatican censure, we'd been asking the question, how do we let people know we've been doing this? We had our 40th anniversary party. How do we let people know we've been doing this for 40 years? Who knew the Vatican could answer our prayer? I mean, really. <laughs> but, but meditation, rather than, meditation leads you to not push back, not to fight against, but rather to fight for a vision. At least that's my experience of it, where all can be included. And so what would I recommend to, to lawmakers? Oh, that they do meditation. I mean, it opens you up to the fact that I'm not the measure of everything. I'm not in control. And if I accept that, then I, need other, then I need help, I need others. Politicians don't often think they need others, but it's true, they do. So that, that'd be my John the Baptist activity in a Christian <laughs> metaphor. Yeah. Well, since we are in um, the political season, ah, uh, yes. we have a question from Twitter. In your address to the 2014 Unitarian General Assembly, <laughs> you spoke about walking towards trouble. You've written against Trump's policy as an example of walking towards trouble. What impact do you hope to have on this election? <laughs> trouble? <laughs> um, I, I really think that um, too often we are tempted in politics to do the calculated, the focus group, the um, uh, distilled, refined, sanded down, boring stuff. And I think really what's called for in this time is to walk, to, to not withdraw, but to engage, to walk towards it. And the fact is, okay, my community is social workers, and what you do with a bully is you confront them. And quite frankly, it appears to me that Donald Trump is acting as the bully in the schoolyard, trying to intimidate people. Well, stop it. So that's what uh, Bishop Carcagno, Minerva Carcagno, who's a Methodist bishop, and I wrote an op-ed to say, stop it. Now, it got some good play. He hasn't stopped it yet. But if I get a chance, I would like to meet with, uh, we've been trying to meet with the Republican candidates, because um, I'd really like to talk to him about this. Why are you doing this? You're better than that. Hmm. Our nation is better than that. But see, what it requires is the willingness to engage and not write them off. Too easy, it's too easy to say fluke. I mean, that's what's been said for months. Uh, well, it's taken a long time for this fluke to peter out. So we better get serious about engagement. And that means real conversation. And so that's my walking towards trouble, is you don't, when there is challenge and a problem, you, go, you lean into it. There was all that leaning in for a while. That was weird. But, but you walk towards it. But that's also the product of meditation, is that if you're meditating, we know that we only do our part. If I'm just doing my part, why should I be afraid? I mean, really. I believe in the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit's in charge. I'll just do the best I can. And some days, poof, lightning strikes, and it has an effect. And then there's other days where you write an op-ed, and nothing happens. But, but we do our part. That's what makes the difference. Good question. So this next question I'm going to read verbatim from the card. Um, it says, why does it seem like Catholic leaders are the ones destroying social justice policy? Yeah, Paul, why does it? Paul Ryan's tax oh. policy, Catholic justice's recognition of corporations as people, Wisconsin's governor's destruction of collective bargaining. Has Catholic education gone wrong? <laughs> <laughs> No, seminary education went wrong. <laughs> oh, glory, yeah. Well, you got Pope Francis. And then we still have trouble with middle management. That's the challenge. But the, 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 the fact is that Catholicism's really a big tent. 
And the, Pope Francis has these four characteristics, enjoy the gospel, four characteristics for peace building, which is what I think we really need to do. And what Pope Francis is trying to do within the Catholic Church and globally is, and the first is, he says that dialogue matters. Dialogue's more important than protecting your turf. So, and that's what you see. I mean, he goes towards the archbishops that are most critical of him. It's so cool when he was in Philadelphia. Archbishop Chaput is just, you know, so critical with Pope Francis. And all the pictures, is Pope Francis smiling and greeting him and Archbishop Chaput. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but it's all about dialogue, not protecting your turf. The second point is the hunger for unity. Everybody hungers for unity. And Pope Francis is trying to nourish the hunger for unity. There's a problem. I, I thought that was beautiful. I could hunger for unity. But if you do that, if you hunger for unity, I discovered there's a really challenging corollary. To build peace, I have to give up my desire to win. I want to build peace with everybody agreeing with me. <laughs> and that's not going to happen. The third one is realities are more important than theories. And that's what goes to our politicians and much of our church leadership is they have no experience of the real stories of real people. And so Pope Francis is saying, if we want to build peace, we've got to build the relationship with real people. And then the, finally, the, the whole is greater than the parts. We knew that. But what Pope Francis says is, if you're missing a part, you're missing a whole, and you can't make peace. So we've got to find a way that there's room in this big table for the conversations with the Paul Ryans, which I have to confess, I thoroughly enjoy my conversations with Paul Ryan, and because it's just so much fun, because he's all in his head. And so you give him a story, and then you give him another story, and you give him another story, and he exceptionalizes, exceptionalizes, exceptionalizes. One of these days, I'm chinking away. <laughs> It'll break. So I have a new, I have a new, want to hear my new uh, plot? Yeah. <laughs> okay, cone of silence. I'm still raising the money for this, so I don't have the money for it, but we, we're thinking about doing a new bus trip in the July, and I want to start in Paul Ryan's district and get Paul Ryan to come to the opening of the bus trip so that he can meet my people. And uh, then we want to wander around a bit and then take the bus to the Republican convention and then take the bus to the Democratic convention. So it's about bridging the divides transforming our politics. Doesn't that sound cool? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I have to raise money, so send money or send prayers or whatever that can generate that. But I think, that, I think there's a vision in this, but it goes back to walking towards trouble. Mm -hmm. the, that why would we stay away? If we stay away, we've, we've seeded the whole field. I did that for a while. I, in the, the 80s, when, you know all that, when faith, got hi, faith and politics got hijacked by the right, Ooh, I didn't want to talk faith and politics. Well, I'll talk politics, but I won't talk faith because I didn't want to be identified as a right. We ceded a huge ground. So now we're making up for it. Thanks. So we're going to take a little shift from politics and politicians and to uh, wages that you oh, spoke good. briefly about. Uh, so given the gender and racial wage gap, what are your thoughts on advocating for equitable pay? Do it, damn it. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, such a, that's such a easy thing that can be done. But do you know what we've experienced at Network? We started a new policy. Is that at Network, when we interview uh, for candidates for, for jobs, is the guys always negotiate pay and the women always accept what we give them. So we've started a new policy. We don't negotiate wages. And we make sure everybody knows in the interview. Because rather than trying to get women to negotiate, I mean, that seemed hopeless. Because I couldn't call up somebody and say, now I'm going to call you in a minute and offer you a job and negotiate, would you? <laughs> I mean, that, that's not, you know, I've, I've got enough of an entrepreneurial spirit. I told you I was competitive, but I'm not going to do that with our budget. But the, the, it, that's what happens. So we went to this no negotiation of pay. And then we'll give merit increases and all this other step increases. But we're trying to level the playing field on that. Um, and, and the law should be clear. Equal pay for equal work. Duh. Um, and it, it's such a throwback to the old cultural reality. I don't understand why it's taken us this long. And, and we still haven't succeeded. I mean, it's, it's like the 50s. Oh, the little ladies leaving the house. Isn't that sweet? 
pat her on the head, but give her a paycheck for God's sakes. Um, I, I, I just I don't understand why it's so impossible. I know the free market and this idea of regulation and manda man, uh, mandating wages, you should be able to negotiate whatever. Mm. Only the CEOs who think they need $11 million might resist. So uh, we've got to find a way forward. The other issue that's critical in this is the issue of wealth gap, but that's the racial wealth gap. It's horrifying, and we have got to stand up for the fact that many of the, 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 aver the average wealth of a white household in 2013 dollars is $112,000. The average wealth of an African American household in 2013 dollars is $6,000, and of a Hispanic household is $5,000. That is wrong. And that creates the segregation. Uh, the economic segregation creates racial segregation, creates misperceptions, creates hostility, creates all kinds of problems. And that's why Black Lives Matter, is to raise those issues up. And we've got to do better than that. And, and I, I, as a white woman, wandering around in a white body, have come to realize that I breathe privilege and I have no clue. I have no clue the advantage that I have. And we've got to find a way to bring that to consciousness so we can change it as a society. Not out of guilt, but out of making our nation better. Anyway, so we've got to get over our white guilt, but we've got to deal with our white privilege. Make sense? I hope. Anyway, sermon number one. <laughs> So what would you uh, recommend for steps to design political institutions that can adapt and be responsive to, as you said before, all persons? Go to the Ford School and figure it out. Um, <laughs> I, I, but seriously, I, I, think, I think our model of doing these roundtables, um, I think the next evolution of the roundtable with business is trying to do a roundtables with more diverse people at the table. Uh, there's a bunch of efforts at civility. There's a bunch. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor has O'Connor House in um, Phoenix, where they're trying to create uh, uh, groups of civil discourse around Arizona. And if they can do it in Arizona, you would think <laughs> they could do it most any place. Um, so I think there's some efforts at that. I think we may finally be getting tired of polarization and toxicity. Uh, but do you know the real conversation that's going on in this election is about the role of government. What is the role of government? And we've got to be serious in trying to figure out how does government create a level playing field. In every one of the business roundtables, they said the role of government was to create a level playing field for business. <laughs> Everybody said that. But don't get government too involved, okay? Because people want the edge. And we've got, we the people have got to say, OK, we'll create a level playing field. But that means realistic regulation that doesn't become the volume. Oh, this one, uh, we were in uh, Davenport. Do you know in Davenport, at, at a business roundtable, we had the, uh, vice pre the senior vice president of a bank that's 150 years old, Clinton Bank of Iowa. Their opening in April of uh, 1860, what was it, 1865, was overshadowed by the assassination of President Lincoln. They said they'd gotten over it over the years. <laughs> but, but what happened is they have resisted the takeover from all the other big banks because they're based in uh, farming communities in relationship. But the thing that could be the death knell of them is uh, Dodd-Frank, because Dodd-Frank is built for the mega banks. And the Clinton Bank of Iowa didn't have any lobbyists at the table to say, hey, don't forget about us. Don't forget about us. And so they're having to do the very same things that Chase and IBM, and uh, not IBM, uh, Bank of America and Wells Fargo are having to do. Doesn't make sense. But because Clinton Bank of Iowa didn't have a lobbyist, they got rolled into the whole story. So we need some way to get everybody at the table. More conversation. One more. 
this may be a very challenging question. Oh, but, good. Unlike the others. <laughs> what, pol <laughs> what policy changes do you believe both conservatives and liberals can agree upon in the near future? I warned you. Thanks. <laughs> I, you know, I say, you know, brain transplants are not in the Affordable Care Act. So I don't know that I could, you know, say what we'll agree on. There is a way where uh, immigration, well, okay, where I really think we're close to something is on criminal justice reform. This is, this is an intersection where, praise God, people are waking up that the economics and the social story are coming together to, to make a, a bridge. And Cor Senator Cory Booker and Rand Paul have created a coalition that are working on this. So I, I think something, and Grassley's been holding out for reasons I haven't quite understood, but he said the other day they're close to an agreement. So th that actually could happen in this year. Um, I also think there's mostly an agreement about immigration reform. There's mostly uh, agreements around uh, some of the, the um, improvement of the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit, which are some key issues to support low-wage working families. My only problem with them, I'm, not, I'm advocating for them. My problem is, is that they're business subsidies, and we need to see them that way um, and challenge businesses to stand up and speak for them. Um, but our people need to be able to eat, so I'm willing to take it. Uh, and then we have to talk living wage. We've got a long way to go on that one. So those are some of the areas. Uh, ironically, do you know what the big, con big controversy right now is the childhood nutrition reauthorization? It used to be a bipartisan thing. Kids should eat. What a radical thought. Now it's polarized. But the irony is, is many of the Republicans that are opposing it have to deal with the farmers who want it because that's their constituents. So they're caught in this political posturing versus really taking care of our kids. And um, Debbie Stabenow has been doing some really good work on this, uh, your senator. And uh, so any support that she can get from you all or just encouragement to keep at it. Uh, but it's a huge challenge, which should not be a partisan issue. Something I think we could all agree on is kids should eat. But they're worried about waste, fraud, and abuse. Their kids are throwing out apples. <laughs> <laughs> Having health standards, what a radical thought. If any of you have seen Michael Moore's new film, I, he has a, a, a France. France is a lovely... He does food in France. It's wonderful. Check it out. And, and I'm not a big Michael Moore fan because sometimes he's too strident. But uh, this movie has humor, positiveness, enjoyment. It, it's, it's a pleasure to watch as he stomps around the world trying to invade. It's pretty funny. So. One more question. Uh, during the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps hired untrained, unemployed people to replant the forests. Why can't the government hire uh, the unemployed to build the housing that we need today? What a great idea. Why don't we hire people to rehab the vacant housing? Why don't we do something to invest in our society? It's because the partisan gridlock won't allow the funding of anything. A new, uh, we have lost the idea that the role of government is to invest in our future. I, I mean, the interstate highway program was created by Dwight D. Eisenhower in order to, well, ironically, got sold as to evacuate our cities in case of a nuclear attack. <laughs> I mean, that was interesting, but that was the politics of the time. So let's figure out what the politics of our time are, but let's invest in our future. I was recently in Michigan, uh, not Michigan, in Minnesota, the other M, sorry, the Minnesota, and they have serious infrastructure problems. I, I haven't learned what your infrastructure problems are, but the willful refusal of politicians to say, let's invest in our future. And this one gets me. This is where the tax fight's going to be really serious, is the idea of business that they should get a free ride in investing in the infrastructure they need to be a good business. This is going to be a big fight. But if you want to haul your trucks across our highways, you better invest in them. And you, everyone pay their fair share. My other favorite one, is, this is my General Electric one. If you want to do business with the government, you have to pay a basic tax. 
you have to pay your part in. Because General Electric, I forget what percentage of their business is done with government contracts, but it's a huge percentage. And they've paid zero taxes for years. Because what they do is they buy up financial organizations that are uh, belly up, and they use the losses from those corporations to offset their profits. So they end up not having a profit. So they don't have to pay any tax. It's been going on for years. If you're going to do business with the government, you pay your fair share. That's the provision that I'm advocating. You can imagine a few might oppose that. But, <laughs> but everybody should pay their fair share. Poor people do. Poor people do. <laughs> uh, can you share any funny jokes or anecdotes about the park? No, I, I have a very, I'm very serious. I have no sense of humor. <laughs> can I share any anecdotes? I didn't listen. I'm sorry. Oh, can you share any funny jokes or anecdotes about the Pope? Oh, about the Pope. Yeah. Oh, I did about his talk. Let's see. Oh, I've got a good one. Uh, this is from. <laughs> For the Catholics in the crowd. This is from uh, one of our sisters on the bus last fall. She had been, she's a school sister in Notre Dame, and she was at their mother house, their central house in Rome in August. And they had some kind of reception, and a, uh, a security guy from the Pope uh, was there at the reception. There were several security guys. I, I, I don't know why. I didn't understand that part. But anyway, so she's talking to the security guys with a group of her sisters, and the guy says to her, you know, the Pope's impossible to guard. He's just impossible to guard because he keeps walking into the crowd. And so the, he said, for example, in July, they'd been in downtown Rome in the heat of the day, the heat of the afternoon, and someone thrusts into the Pope's hands a glass of some refreshing drink. And the security guy reported that he jumps in and he's wrestling with the Pope <laughs> to, to keep him from drinking this glass. And the security guy said that Pope Francis looked him in the eye and said, in Italian, it's not from the cardinals, don't worry. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? <laughs> Um, so isn't campaign finance reform, including this, uh, overturning the Citizens United decision, the key to reducing lobbyists' stranglehold on politicians? Wouldn't politicians create more equitable policies if they weren't indebted to PACs? Probably. But the pragmatic story is it ain't happening. So we, the people, can't sit around and wait for a miracle of campaign finance reform. I mean, let's be real about this. It requires a constitutional amendment or more untimely deaths on the Supreme Court. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to advocate for that, because you see what, what mess that creates. So um, the fact is, we can't sit by and wait. True, it would be a lot easier if we could overturn, well, I think it, we could be a lot easier if we overturned Citizens United. But I think we have to be careful about the, the certitude that it's money's the problem. Because look at Jeb Bush. Jeb Bush had a billion dollars. He had untold funding, and it didn't matter. There's something deeper than money. It's not just money. It's whether or not we have the sense that we're in this together. Do I have your back? And that's the piece where I think we, the people, make the difference. So yeah, I'd love to have campaign finance reform. I think it's sort of like women's ordination in the Catholic Church. You know, it's going to be a long time coming. <laughs> so let's, let's do what needs doing. Let's not stop because we can't get the ideal. So let's keep at it. Let's work. Let's, let's do what needs doing. So this would be our last set of questions for t today. All right, few of the exams over. I feel like my oral. <laughs> I think I'll pass. But they're both very related. Oh, okay. As a role model for Catholic act activists, what advice can you give us when we go to the polls? Vote. And the second question is, <laughs> <laughs> what are your suggestions for balancing religious and political beliefs? Now that's interesting. Because that assume, balancing assumes two sides. I don't think they're different. 
for me, the faith perspective is about how we breathe. It's about how we internalize, how we take in the fact that we're all in this together. And to say that, oh, my faith is over here and my politics is over here, that's schizophrenia. That's a mental illness. We, we can't do that. And I think some of our leadership, the middle management trouble, uh, some of that is because what our leaders did was substitute rules for spiritual leadership. Mm -hmm. And if you've just got the idea that faith is about this external set of rules, any faith, you know, the Jewish tradition with the Ten Commandments or the, you know, the, all of the strictures in the Torah, or we do with all of our church regulations or whatever, that creates an outside piece. And what I know is a spiritual truth. Okay, blah, 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 this is risky. But what I know is a spiritual truth, the contemplative truth, is that we're created by God at every moment. I, I have this idea that God hums each one of us at every moment. It's not that God is separate out there. It's not that God is pulling the strings. It's that we're loved into being at every moment. And the, the challenge becomes, how do I then embody that love and show it out? And that's where it comes into politics, is how do I embody the love that creates me to meet the love that creates you? And we find a way forward together. It's not separate. It's not out there. It's not controlled with strings. It's hummed with a wonderful symphony as we all create different tones in different ways together. That's the chorus that we need. That's what we need. So can I, since it was the last question, can I end with a poem? Is that sure. legit? Okay. Because it fits right on this. And um, it's the last poem. I've got some of my poems in, the, in my book. I think of them as like my children. But anyway, but this poem is called Incarnation. It's what we're challenged to do, is to do our part. And um, so it has some Middle East references because I wrote it, I oh, can't believe it. I wrote it last night in Baghdad in 2002, so after we went to an Italian restaurant. But uh, <laughs> the, we came back from the restaurant and in the light from the, our hotel's plate glass window was this wedding party and uh, they were dancing because it was in the light of the window and they had an old violin and this accordion and we got drawn in to dance. There were 11 of us and we got drawn in to dance. Well, I'm a poet, I'm not a dancer. And, but this guy dancing next to me trying to show me this, this folk dance, he leans over and he says, how long do my niece and her new husband have to live in peace? How long until you start bombing us? the global aspect of what we're talking about. Well, anyway, so here's, here's the poem that was given that night. It's called Incarnation. That's the embodiment of God. That's that being the love that we're being created by. And it goes like this. Let gratitude be the beat of our heart, pounding Baghdad rhythms, circulating memories, meaning of the journey. Let resolve flow in our veins, fueled by Basra's destitution risking reflective action in a 15-second world. Let compassion be our hands, reaching to be with each other, all others, to touch, hold, heal this fractured world. Let wisdom be our feet, bringing us to the crying need to friends or foe to share this body's blood. Let love be our eyes that we might see the beauty, see the dream, lurking in the shadows of despair and dread. And let community be our body warmth, radiating Arab energy to welcome in the foreign stranger, even the ones who wage this war. And let us remember on drear distant days, we are a promised Christmas joy. We live as one this fragile, gifted life, for we are the body of God. Thank you very much.
Simone, thank you so much for your remarks and for such a rich, wide-ranging conversation. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us here and for all of your questions. I hope you will um, come back on Monday. We will have our last policy talks of this academic year, and our speaker will be General George Casey, Jr. Um, so I hope that you will also stay and continue this conversation. We have a reception and also a book signing just outside of our great hall, outside of the doors, um, right here. And so please uh, join us for that reception. And if you'll join me in a final round of thanks for Sister Simone, that was wonderful. Thank you.